Everyone, thank you all for joining us today in the Matrix AI seminar series. Today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Dr. Nancy Chen, who is joining us from Singapore. It's pretty late out there for her. Thank you so much for accommodating our time schedule. Uh, Dr. Chen received her PhD from MIT and Harvard in 2011. She worked at MIT Lincoln Lab on her PhD research in multilingual speech processing. And she's currently leading research efforts in conversational AI and natural language generation with applications related to education, healthcare, journalism, and defense at the Institute for Infocom Research, all areas that Matrix AI Consortium deeply cares about. And her research unit is currently part of the ASTAR in Singapore, one of the premium research units. Speech evaluation technology developed by Dr. Chen's team is deployed at the Ministry of Education in Singapore to support home-based learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Chen also led a cross-continent team for low-resource spoken language processing, which, one, which was one of the top performance in the NIST Open Keyword Search Evaluations funded by IRPA Babel program. And she has received numerous awards, including the 2023 IEEE SPS Distinguished Lecturer Singapore, 100 Women in Tech Young Scientist Award at Mikai in 2021, Best Paper Award at SIGTA L in 2021, and the list goes on. And she also has the NIH Ruth Kirsten National Research Award from 2004 to 2008. Currently, she's leading several prominent AI conferences as a program chair. Um, I Claire, 2023 elected board member of ISCA, which is the International Speech Communication Association, and several other things in signal processing. We are really honored to have her join us today and Looking forward to your talk, Nancy. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> so I um, apologize in, the, uh, in advance that I'm recovering from um, a cold. So, uh, but this is a virtual talk. So hopefully this won't be too big of a problem for projecting my voice. Yeah, so <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, so it's uh, very nice to have you here. Um, I will... Um, try to go to the next slide. Yeah. So, uh, I guess, yeah, thanks so much for the kind introduction and, uh, I just listed some <laughs> other things here. Um, yeah, so I've been in the field of speech and language processing machine learning for the past 20 years, supervised more than hundred students and staff. And in, in addition to the academic, um, endeavors also, um, worked on more translational stuff that's uh, led to government deployment and spin-off companies. Uh, and so uh, I'm very glad today to have this opportunity to uh, share with you um, some of my recent research work. So uh, I'll go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so what we'll be talking about uh, is at the intersection between generative artificial intelligence and natural language processing. So in this overlapping um, region is natural language generation. And so within it, uh, if you use neural models to do the language generation task, then it's neural language generation. It also intersects uh, with computer vision uh, because the modality of the inputs in natural language generation could also include uh, visual data and the output as well. So, so this is kind of the landscape of how the different fields might intersect with each other. <clears throat> so for generative AI, uh, it's a subfield of AI that can be used to create new content. So this new content could include audio, speech, images, text, and videos. And um, some very famous recent examples of applications include ChatGPT and Dolly. So <clears throat> for natural language generation, I thought we zoom in a little more. Uh, so in the field of natural language processing, uh, there's natural language generation and it intersects a little bit with 
natural language understanding. So technically they're dualities of each other, but they intersect um, partially because uh, in theory, if you wanna generate well, you need to understand the language reasonably well. So, so there is some relationship there. Um, and here, um, <clears throat> Natural language generation tasks, uh, the inputs uh, could be all these different types or a combination of any of these text, audio, speech, images, video, or multimodal data. And the output is typically human understandable text or it includes human understandable text. And so uh, here I list some of the applications and some of them are more classic than others. So these include machine translation when you have um, <clears throat> one language that you want to convert to another language summarization when you want to concise the content question answering and dialogue technology chatbot these are more interactive and it could be multiple rounds of interaction uh, it could be image or video captioning or report generation or story creation so um, i wanted to um, kind of give some uh, context to this. So what the relationship between language generation and language models. So um, <clears throat> nowadays they're uh, using large pre-trained language models uh, has become uh, very customary to help boost performance. <clears throat> and um, it, so, so these, it, the more uh, neutral term should be foundation model where it's uh, not necessarily related to text, although most commonly right now, all of them are large language models. So these uh, foundation models or large language models serves as a background model to help warm up training for downstream tasks. Uh, and a lot of these um, training techniques for the large language models have also been very influential in other areas in machine learning and NLP, and you can also use it for the downstream tasks. So in this talk, uh, we're not going to talk about how you train a large language model, but we'll focus more on the research approaches of how you can best leverage these large pre-trained language models. Uh, and uh, so, and then, so just another context is that usually uh, these large language models, they, they can help two types of tasks. The natural language understanding tasks are usually more classification tasks and natural language generation is where your output is uh, a bunch of texts. So then in that sense, it's not classification. So before going uh, a little deeper to the natural language generation part, I wanted to give a little bit of a historical context of what is a language model. So basically language models are just computational approaches to win a word guessing game. And we actually, as human beings, we also have language models in our brains that uh, help us understand the world better. So if you're in like a very noisy place and you couldn't hear some parts of the sentence, you use your own language model to fill in the gaps. So we, we do this subconsciously or consciously on a daily basis. So here's an example. If you hear the word think without any other context, the most likely term next is you, but it could also be me or God or other words. And so you might know different languages and the language model ability of the different languages could differ as well. So for non-native speakers of English, uh, it might be harder to um, piece out what actually was said in a noisy environment because your language model in English might be less strong than uh, others. So, so this is one way to look at it. And then uh, I wanted to also bring your attention to um, uh, the, the, this time frame, uh, actually uh, using computational approaches to uh, model languages has been around for more than a century. So uh, at, as early as uh, 1913, Markov already started using language models to predict if the next letter is a consonant or a vowel in certain historical texts and Shannon in his influential papers in, in uh, information theory also brings up how uh, we might use language models to predict what's the next word in English. And um, language models have had a lot of influence and drove a lot of progress in a lot of speech recognition systems 
and then we've seen concrete examples at IBM and CMU in the 1970s. Um, and then there are different variations to it where um, to address the data sparsity problem. So, so traditionally, when you look at it from a statistical perspective, you use the n-gram model where you is a conditional probability knowing uh, words in the past can help you present uh, uh, predict the next word. And so, this is a simple model that has uh, gained a lot of popularity. And but the problem is for words you've never seen, then you don't do as well. So this. Data sparsity problem has been an issue, uh, but then for the past, past 20 years, um, neural networks uh, modeling approaches have come to play and uh, help solve a lot of these challenges. So, for example, with vector representations, where for uh, text data can be represented as vectors of continuous numbers to model the underlying semantics in a much more fine grain manner. This helps resolve a lot of the data sparsity issues. And then there are a lot of other recent um, uh, developments, some related to self-supervised learning um, and some related to the attention mechanism has all made it uh, the modeling power a lot um, stronger. And so, so these uh, are was in the backbone of these language models, and a lot of these uh, also influence other aspects of machine learning as well. So that's some background on language models. Uh, and then, uh, if we uh, go back to neural language generation, um, so I want to give a quick summary about this. So, neural gen language generation is when you use neural modeling and apply it to natural language generation tasks. So, um, so, and we often use these pre-trained language models to boost performance these days. And the pros of these, this approach of using neural models is that it requires a lot less domain knowledge to train. Um, but the, the limitations uh, also come with it. Uh, and so part of it is that these neural models are very, very data hungry. So you need a lot of data to uh, fuel it. And then the generation outputs are notoriously hard to control. So uh, they could be factually inconsistent, logically incorrect, or socially inappropriate. So, uh, so based on this, uh, I have four research themes uh, in my work in this area of neural language generation to help address these challenges in computational approaches. So the first one, is scalable data augmentation. So this refers to resourceful approaches in addressing the data hungry needs of training deep learning models. The second theme is factually consistent language generation. So although neural language models are very adept at generating very fluent text descriptions that are grammatically correct, the underlying models often overfit and might learn spurious correlations between the input features and output labels. So we investigate, in, investigate techniques that can preempt the incorrect associations between the input features and the output labels. The third theme is controllable neural modeling. So it's very hard to control the generation outputs of these neural models. And so we examine means to do so where we can harness the potential of these models more fully. Uh, and last but not least, the world we live in is a very multimodal and sensory uh, in nature. So, in addition to modeling the linguistic dimension of the world in text format, we can also consider other modalities, such as visual or audio dimensions, to complement and enrich the representations and contextualization of these language models. So, okay, so I'm going to start, okay, yeah, and then I'm going to give an overview of the different types of technical approaches that we use. Um, so, here are three of them. So the first one uh, is self-supervised learning and noisy data augmentation to improve robustness. The second one is feature disentanglement, and this helps minimize model bias. Uh, and the third one is coherence and causal modeling and for temporal and spatial reasoning. So they help support uh, these four research themes that I mentioned in different ways. Uh, and then uh, so I'll give some examples of our research uh, uh, later. And before going into that, I, I thought I, I spend one more slide on 
on data. So people have always wondered, you know, is there a saturation point to the amount of data you, you get? Uh, so far, we haven't seen that. So there's the saying, there's no data like more data. So it seems like the more data you have, it's always better. Um, most of the time and uh, noisy data is better than no data. So a tiny bit of noisy data simulating the truth is infinitely better than zero data. So, <coughs> so yeah, so, um, so here we'll, we'll show some examples where synthetic or simulated training data can be very useful and it's very practical because it's much lower cost to prepare uh, than to collect real data. It helps boost strapping and it improves model robustness because um, you get uh, more var variety of data. Uh, and But still real world test data is needed for rigorous evaluation. And then uh, for self-supervised representation learning, basically it, it means that you wanna define subtasks very resourcefully without additional need of annotations. So because annotations are very costly, so is there a way where I can derive another task uh, and uh, that is related to my goal uh, and, and train it without additional annotations with whatever I already have? Um, and then you could also strategically inject noise to make the model learn how to denoise. De de so that's also a strategy. And then another thing to mention that these days, the boundaries between features and the model have become blurry uh, because uh, <clears throat> the representations of different modalities um, are, 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 th are the same or similar. Okay, so um, the first example I wanted to show is where how you can use data augmentation to summarize clinical conversations. So due to privacy concerns, it's very hard to obtain clinical conversations for training. And so here what we did was we um, uh, had made two pools of uh, data types. The first one is uh, in career response template pool, which basically is a question answer template pool. The second one is uh, values of important entities. So if you <laughs> randomly pick one of these uh, question and answer pairs in the template pool, you might get something like this. And then uh, for the hashtagged parts, uh, they could be represented in different entity values. So here, basically the idea is in these clinical conversations, um, the nurses are trying to uh, get the symptom information from the patient. So um, there are different attributes that could characterize the symptoms. So some of it is related to the intensity of the symptom, how the frequency of the symptom and when the symptom occurs. So these are different types of attributes that each symptom might have. And so we can, um, once we have these templates with these entity values, we could enrich the verbal expressions and track through all the symptom attribute pairs exhaustively. Uh, and then because this is done in a simulated way, we wanna double check the logical correctness and validate the clinical correctness as well. And through this kind of method, uh, we can come up with a simulated multi-turn dialogue data set and this can help us train a dialogue summarization, dialogue summarization model between nurses and patients. And um, in, in this case, uh, then we can save the very limited real world data as the test data. Uh, and so here what we did, uh, I'll just uh, go through it. So basically we have two very simple assumptions. The first one is for each dialogue turn, in this case, a question answer pair, it's characterized by the dialogue states, which are the pink or purple highlighted parts. And so these are the key information needed. The other is these question answer pairs are independent of one another, so the sequence doesn't matter. So by these two assumptions, we can, and with the process that I just laid out, we can boost the training data by 100 times. And this is a data augmentation method that is clean where I'm in, 
interpolating the possible sample points within this framework. Um, and so then after I do that, I can use my real world clinical data and validate the performance of the model. Uh, and we have expanded this approach to other domains as well. So this could be in travel booking where uh, you could have uh, uh, um, classes that have less data. So if there's a class imbalance problem um, where using similar approaches could help resolve it as well. Okay, so this is one example. Um, the other example I wanted to talk about is where we deliberately inject noise to the model so that the model can learn how to denoise. So here actually we have two examples. One is where I have targeted noise. So in this example, I want to um, summarize social media information. Um, and in this case, uh, we, we observe that when you're summarizing who does what, a lot of times the model gets these personal name entities wrong. So here we, we know this is a weakness in the modeling. So what we do is we try to tag out these personal name entities such as Marcus, Mark, Anna, and then we, we um, corrupt it by taking out these personal name entities. So we force the model to learn when should you insert the right personal name entity? So this is an entity-based denoising model training that we did, and this helps boost performance. Um, on the other <coughs> side, on the right-hand side, we see a case in machine translation where we insert random noise. And in this case, um, it, it's trying to simulate uh, in, in social media, there could be typos, there could be creative usage of language uh, that is slang. Uh, and so some of these are very hard to predict. They have maybe there might be regional preferences of how these might happen. And so <clears throat> by using random, by inserting random characters in the text, uh, we are and then asking the model to still come up with the right answers. Uh, in the translation examples also helps strengthen the model's robustness. Um, and then this is uh, another example where we use contrastive learning. Um, and in this, in this example, um, the task is text style transfer. So um, the two public data sets that are pretty well known for this task include sentiment transfer, or and formality transfer. So sentiment is you know from positive sentiment to negative or vice versa. Form, formality, formality transfer is informal and formal style and transfer in between. <coughs> so in in this example, what uh, here showed show, shown in the graph is that let's assume the sentiment transfer case. Then um, from the source sentence in blue. Uh, I can pull it out from a negative from the negative polarity set. So here, it's um, the sentiment is negative. I use it to do a match to the positive polarity set. So I there are two ways to do the match. One is a lexical match, and the other is a semantic match. And once I find this, um, then I can use contrastive learning. Um, to sharpen the modeling between these two polarities. Uh, and so in, in this case, I am basically uh, constructing a pseudo parallel data set for sentiment style transfer. And, and so, uh, and then on top of that, we also apply reinforcement learning. And, and once we had the bootstrap model, then with reinforcement learning, we can do <clears throat> pretty well and, and reach state of the art performance. So the idea here is that traditionally uh, you will need this parallel data set, which is very expensive to construct. But right now through making a pseudo one through this lexical and semantic similarity match, then I can, <coughs> I can boost the performance uh, 
without having this parallel data set. And that's been pretty useful. Um, and here we want to show an example where we can extend contrastive learning to the multimodal context and also use it for causal modeling. So for your causal modeling, there's uh, two aspects that you need to know. One is the factual part. So factual means something has happened. Uh, there's also the counterfactual part, something that did not happen. So these are two, you can think of it as the two polarities uh, that we're looking at in causal modeling. And so here we could do this for th the two modalities. So for, for, let's say for this sentence, as he walks towards the back of the living room, um, the, the factual uh, data is where you mass out irrelevant information uh, that you're attempting to model. And then the counterfactual one, you actually mass out the essential information. So then you will have uh, text data that has the factual component and text data that has the counterfactual component. You can also do this to the videos. Uh, and then on the visual side, you'll also have the factual and counterfactual. Um, so yeah, so then by doing this, you can have counterfactual contrastive learning uh, on two different modalities and it and it's um and compositionally it can help you um, learn how to do visual question answering better and so this is uh, another example where you can expand what i just mentioned into uh, multimodal um, scenarios so so here I want to do a quick summary before I move on to the next theme. Um, so in these examples, they were all related to self-supervised learning. The first example is in a, a, a case of clean data augmentation. So I basically interpolate uh, within the boundaries of, that I set up to create more training samples. And this is can be used to address class imbalance and data sparsity issues or tackle privacy concerns um, when I just don't have access to data. Um, the second example is noisy data to improve robustness. So this, you can think of it as more of uh, extrapolating um, by using noise. So it could be targeted noise to strengthen speculated weaknesses of the model. It could be random noise. So in this case, in spirit is similar to dropout, but instead of taking away, you're injecting noisy variants. And the third case is contrastive learning, where you can sharpen the model distinction between positive and negative examples. So it could be a subtask within your modeling that you can derive. And so you can, in that sense, you can exploit it in co combination with what I just mentioned above. And uh, we showed an example where you, how you can use it in causal modeling. So. So now I'm going to switch gears a bit to talk about um, disentangling features. So uh, in deep learning, a fundamental characteristic is that the features are very highly dimensional and they are entangled with each other, making it very difficult to interpret the models, which is why we often say deep learning is a black box. So sometimes this results in the models cheating without us realizing it explicitly. So, for example, summarization is a core task in natural language processing. So, academic work has focused on news summarization since news articles are publicly available and very well written. So, ideally, you want a summarization model to learn what is semantically important in the article. But what often happens is that the model might find a shortcut and just choose the first three sentences in the article and performs brilliantly well. So this is this happens to be because many news articles um, use the inverted pyramid writing style. So in this kind of writing style, the first couple sentences captures the main gist of the story before the news article unfolds the details and elaborates. So if your test set is always in the same writing style, then maybe you're fine. 
But the problem is this kind of model won't generalize well, right? So, so if you have other things that you want to summarize or other news articles, or it may not be news articles that you want to summarize and uh, it, it just tags on to the first three sentences, it, it won't work so well. So the idea here is that um, we can use disentangled features to train the models instead. Uh, then it, in theory, should generalize very well to other writing styles. So here, what we did was we um, <clears throat> projected the features into three dimensions. So uh, importance and diversity are traditionally uh, thought of as uh, important features in computational linguistics for summarization, because summarization is often formulated as a task where you want to have a good trade-off of the two. You want to capture all the important information, but at the same time, you want to be able to diversify the subtopics within your summary. Uh, and position is traditionally there uh, because we know there is a correlation uh, between where you place the sentence and it, it might affect the importance of the sentence. So if we uh, disentangle the features um, that we have and use these three disentangled feature dimensions to, uh, <clears throat> to, to look at the model, so then I can choose to just train my model using importance and diversity. Okay. And uh, technically, and so so that's what we did. So what we found out that if we just use importance and diversity distinct, disentangled features to train the model, um, then it can still reach state of the art and extractive new summarization. And then if I use this model that you know doesn't have the positional features. Uh, and then I directly apply it to meeting summarization. This is a new untrained task without any fine tuning. I can still reach state of the art for extractive summarization. So this is uh, an example where uh, we, we can show that you can remove the feature bias in these tasks uh, and, and it will generalize better. It will give you more controllability uh, and explainability uh, in your models as well. And so, so this uh, is work that was um, done a couple years ago. And uh, if you want to understand more of the, some of the details of how the computational linguistic aspects were defined, you can go to this paper. Okay, so here I want to give another example, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit before. Um, but uh, here is an example where we observe when and why do the neural models hallucinate. So one example that we've seen is that in language, we often refer to the same person, you know, with their official name or their nickname, their role, their occupation, or certain pronouns. So this uh, in linguistics is called co-referencing. So uh, it takes children several years to learn these types of co-referencing. Uh, and from our experience, it's also non-trivial for neural networks to, to learn this kind of co-referencing as well. So when we are looking at um, conversational or interaction information across different speakers or uh, participants in a conversation, uh, we, we often see that there's factually inconsistent generations that stem from the model that association, associating the wrong person with a certain action. So here we want to help the neural models by formulating co-reference chains that are that all point to the same identity. So misunderstanding is less likely to happen. So so here um, in we see a conversation between two people, Natalie and Sam. Uh, and then they, they're they talking about the patient, Howdy, uh, who is Sam's father, and they also mention his new girlfriend, Julie. So in this three-turn conversation, it's a very short conversation, 
uh, different people are referred to. And so I color coded them. Uh, and so these are the co-reference chains. So you can see these co-reference chains, they go across uh, speaker turns, they go across utterances. So in that sense, they are not, uh, it's a structural kind of data. It's not, it's not sequential. And so traditionally we, we know that um, current machine learning does pretty well on struct uh, on sequence data, but on structural data, it, it may not always work as well. And so, so here with these co-reference chains, we want to strengthen the semantic and temporal coherence, and we can do this through a graphical neural network. So, so here it's more in text form of what I just mentioned. So, um, so by doing this, uh, by modeling the co-reference chain chains and um, taking advantage of the structural relations that it embodies through a graphical neural network, we are able to strengthen the semantic and temporal coherence of the model so that the output, uh, the output um, generations have improved factual consistency. And also another byproduct that we get is that we can generate summaries based on different personal perspectives. So now, um, we, we have more controllability of what type of perspective we want to give the summary. Is it from the patient's perspective, from the nurse's perspective, from the caregiver's perspective? Yeah, so, so this insight of using co-reference chains, um, and modeling it through graphical neural networks, um, to help, uh, make hallucination less likely to happen, hallucinations when there's factual inconsistency. This has helped us uh, win a best paper award and a lot of follow-on work related to this. So this is an example where um, from your observations, you can make more implicit complex relations explicit to the neural model so it's easier for it to do different modeling. So here uh, we also expanded um, the temporal reasoning uh, perspective to spatial the spatial dimension in the multimodal context as, as well. So uh, we not only exploit both the spatial and temporal level information, we will also learn the dynamic information diffusion between the two feature spaces through spatial to temporal and temporal to spatial reasoning in a visual question answering task. So this bi-directional uh, strategy helps to tackle the evolving semantics of user queries in the dialogue setting and the retrieved visual cues are used as a contextual information to construct relevant responses to the users. So, um, so here we, we list some publications where, uh, we, we, we do this, um, reasoning, uh, in both the temporal and spatial domain and use different techniques to, to help us model. So we have a better. Um, contextualization of uh, the dialogue, and so we can model things better. Um, so, so yeah, so that's the last example that I wanted to share. And so th this is a summary of the different approaches that we talked about and how they might help address challenges um, in the four research themes. So, um, yeah, so I hope this helped um, make neuro model language generation uh, a bit easier to understand and appreciate so that it's not just like a back black box anymore and hopefully inspire some of you to consider making more progress in this area as well. Yeah, so thank you.